Welcome back to the third part of this series on creating a Netcat clone in Rust. So this time we're going to look at how we move data around within our program. So getting data coming in from standard in out to the network and data coming in from the network out to standard out. And to understand how that's going to work in Rust, it's helpful to understand how Netcat does it. So this is the OpenBSD implementation of Netcat written in C. So don't worry if you're not a C programmer or if you haven't looked at C recently. We're just going to pick out some highlights here to understand what's going on. This read write function is what's responsible for getting data in and out of Netcat. To understand how it works, we need to understand that it's using events. So it's listening for data arriving on the network, the network being ready to send data, and the same with standard IO for input and output. So the first thing it does is set up this array of four elements where each one is a polfd structure or an object, if that's more what you're used to. This is declared outside of this file. We can't go and look at that right now. It doesn't contain anything too interesting. It's three fields as far as we're concerned. It's a file descriptor, which is a general idea in Linux of something that can be read from or written to. So the network or standard IO. And it also has two pairs of events. So it's the events we want to listen for and the events that we've received. So we can see that being set up just down here. So we're setting up the first element of our array to handle standard in. We set its file descriptor to be the standard in file descriptor. And we ask for events where standard in is ready to be read from. So we are able to do a poll for input. We don't want to do anything with the network initially. We don't want to do anything with standard out initially. And we also want to listen to network in. So that's our setup. Then we start an infinite loop. So we're going to keep going round and round. And every time we run, we're going to call this poll function. So this is what's actually listening for events. So we'll make a system call here. The program will effectively suspend and will be woken up again when there's something ready for us to do. So say some data arrives on standard in. We've told poll that we're interested in hearing about that. So it'll wake us back up. It'll fill in a field on our structure. And we'll be able to then go ahead and read from standard in and do something with that data. So if we skip over some of the error handling here, we can see this is where we read from standard in. So this R events field will have been filled in. So these are bit flags, which are a little tricky to understand. It's something we don't really do in Rust very often. It's something that's very common in C. So we're doing a comparison here with the poll in constant and the R events field. So if they've got the same bit set, we'll end up having this come back as true. So effectively, this condition is saying if the event we received from poll is a poll in for standard in, then we'll go ahead and try and do a read. We then call this function fill buff. This is trying to read data from standard in into a buffer. So we are writing data into this standard in buffer and we're keeping track of this position in the buffer. So we'll fill as much data as we can off standard in. That will either fill the buffer or there'll be less data on standard in than our buffer size. And we'll just read part of that data in to, or partly fill the buffer, we'll read all the data in. And then if we've read something, if there was data put into our buffer, we then set up a new event on our file descriptors that says, I, get, I now care about the network output and I want to wait for that to be ready to write to. So I wait for my network to be ready to receive the data that I just got. We will then go around the loop. And when we receive that R event back for the network, so you can see we've got the corresponding here, the poll net out, poll net out. We've asked for the poll out event when that happens. And we've got data in the standard in buffer. We will then try and write to the network. So we're going to do the opposite. We're going to use this drain buff function that does the opposite of this fill buff. It's going to take our buffer, write as much data as it can to the network. And at that point, we're ready to go back around again. And we have the opposite situation happening with reading from the network, writing to standard out. So we're crossing streams, if you want to think about it like that. And that's really all there is to this. It does a lot of logic here. It does a lot of thinking, does a lot of handling error conditions, timeouts, and lots of options, because this can act like Telnet and all kinds of interesting things, handling TLS. But the, the key idea is this loop that keeps on running and transfers data between two places. 
So that's what we're going to try and build in Rust now. So let's jump over and see how we do that. I started out by adding this library, Tokyo, to our cargo project. This handles a lot of what we just saw. It effectively contains an event loop. The difference is that we don't have to write that loop or a lot of the logic ourselves. We can just spawn tasks into Tokyo and it will take care of running those to completion, handling events, and all of that nasty logic that we don't want to have to write for ourselves. We're going to start out with something a little bit simpler than what we just saw. So rather than trying to get the network involved, let's just do a read from standard in, and anything we get, we'll send it back to standard out. So almost a, an echo in place. So let's write a function that does that. So we'll write an async function called run, which returns a result of empty and string errors. And we want to get hold of standard in and standard out. Tokyo has async versions of those we can go and grab. Tokyo IO standard in. And we'll assign that to a variable. And we want to do the same thing for standard out. And then we want to launch a job on Tokyo. So Tokyo spawn. And we'll declare an async function, which is going to take ownership of its streams. And then there's a helper that we can use to move data between the two called copy. So we'll go Tokyo IO copy from standard in to standard out. And then we'll await that result. And if there's any errors, we'll unwrap. And the same at the top level. Await and unwrap the errors. And then we can finish off by outputting a successful value, assuming everything worked. We then want to call this in main. So we could set up a Tokyo runtime by hand, but we don't need to do that just yet. You can see that for the full program, we will need to. But for the simple example we're doing first, we can just do Tokyo main. So that will tell Tokyo to take over our main program. It's going to actually wrap this main function when we go to compile this so that we can make our main function async. Normally you can't do that. The Rust compiler doesn't know anything about it. It's Tokyo getting involved and making that work. So we can then run our function. So we'll call run, await it, and unwrap any errors. Let's try and get that running with cargo run. And you can see the program hasn't exited. We've stayed alive after the build. So if we type in hello, it comes back. And if we type in test, it comes back. So anything we input to the program, our Tokyo async job is copying that data across to standard out. So all that work we just saw in Netcat that had to deal with buffers, that's all being done for us by Tokyo. And we don't have to think about it. We can just read data, write data. And it's almost as easy when we get the network involved, but there's a little bit more work to do to handle other conditions, like how do we shut the program down when we're done with it? How do we know when the program is finished? So this hasn't been very code heavy, but next time really will be, because we've got to look at all of that logic to get data moving around, and that is going to be much more involved. So come back next time for some more async programming and to really get into how we can make Tokyo work for us.